<laughs> yeah, you know what? I got inoculated to cooties, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Keep them cameras rolling right. <laughs> Get them up, move them out, move them out. Okay, okay. Good sorry. job, all right. Okay. Welcome to Q&A with that intro. Uh, Give a round of applause in the comments. You're you know, not even I, ready. I, I did play at a, before I was a Christian, I did play at a bar that had chicken wire in front of the stage. I'm just saying. Wow. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so. Keep the beer bottles. Keep the beer bottles. I thought the, the tomatoes, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, well, we could eat potatoes. No, yeah. the tomatoes. Oh, tomatoes. When you're bad, uh, people throw tomatoes. You, you get say it? tomato, I, I say, say tomato. tomato. Let's call or it potato. Potato. <laughs> you know. All right. Tomato, yeah. tomato, potato, potato. So much singing Let's call today. The whole thing off. And we were playing jams earlier. Yeah, we're, we're ready to go. Uh, all right, we're ready to go. <laughs> Would you mind praying over these questions? Let's get started, shall we? Yes. 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 Are we yes. rolling yet? Yes. Yes, we're rolling. <laughs> Can you pray over the questions? Yeah, do you want to get started or? <laughs> I think we should get started. I think, I think we, should we should get started. There yes. we go. There no, we however, go. However, yeah, that was a that was a boo Hey, part. welcome to Q and A. <laughs> <laughs> He's got Michelle and Ty. Woohoo! I'm Dave. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for the opportunity to sit together to enjoy life together, Lord. Uh, ministry is anything but boring, that's for sure. So mm -hmm. thank you for this great opportunity, Lord. I pray blessing upon Nephi and the team that works with production, Lord. I pray blessing upon Michelle as she tries desperately to reel Ty and I in. And I pray, Lord, that Ty and I would be submissive today to our sister as she leads us through the questions. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Are you right. distracted by the trucks or is it just me? Those are pretty cool. Oh I my like this. goodness. Those, those, are, those okay. are happening right here, man. That's okay. it. Okay, all yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what did you call them? Trucks. You know, they move you along. Okay, yeah. Meow. They move okay. me along. Sorry. That's for okay, sure. Sorry. But you have some cool kicks too, Ty. I mean, we've got the... Well, yeah, we got the, we got the moccasins. I got the... Yeah, right. they look nice. Yeah. Our so. shoes are on point. Who cares about the hats? <laughs> We've got the shoes Matt. that no one can see. Matt, our... Matt. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right, look, question. I'm going to be honest. This hat's just covering up the bald spot That's that shines on the camera. Thank you. So I saw, I, I, Sylvie and I were watching an episode of Q&A a couple of weeks ago, and I turned my head to talk to Michelle, and I literally at home went, whoa! It, yeah, I didn't realize that You get to see the side it's profile. It's spreading. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, got, I saw the, the spread. Yeah. It's, oh. Really? God wow. loves you just the way you are, Dave. Yeah. Well, the, so do our I viewers, Lord, right? But humor the hair's less. The problem is, I just don't have the right shape head for the shave thing. It's it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Did, have you I, ever tried? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll show you some pictures. It's like, <laughs> whoa. Yeah, it's not good. I just don't have the right shape. Maybe we can drop those in the comments yeah. for the viewers. So when they're watching this, they can Well, that's those. fine. But I still have to live with that cute little redhead that I'm married to. Yeah, so you may not be able to get it's, those pictures. Yeah, I, oh. I, I didn't shave it. I did the real close to the scalp yes. trim. And I actually did a wedding that weekend. <laughs> Oh, oh, so the well, pictures and, are well, out I'll be there. honest okay. with you. Here's what happened. I, I went to get my hair cut to do the wedding, and um, they did not do a good job. In fact, it was one of those places. I went in saying, hi, I'm old. I'm 50. Don't go high and tight, okay? I'm, I'm not a hipster. I'm, I'm doing a wedding. Make it look nice. And then I fell asleep, and what? they did the thing. I always sleep when I get my hair cut. Don't you sleep when they do your hair? No. Oh, I sleep. I'm out. Oh yeah, I I'm sleep out. when cut. How many of you sleep yeah. when you get your First hair cut? Yeah. First I'm question. I'm telling you right now. You, you sleep They start you get washing your hair my cut. hair, I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm out. If, when you fall asleep, you can't enjoy it. Because then you're sleeping. That's how I enjoy it. I'm out. It's a nap. Anyway, <laughs> I woke up, awesome. looked in the mirror, and literally said, you've got to be kidding. And the, the gal, God bless her, very nice young lady, full sleeves nostril rings, eyelid rings, and she was pierced everywhere. Very nice young lady, but she I guess she thought she was cutting her 19-year-old boyfriend's hair. It was like, this is, I'm a pastor, no. So um, I stopped off at the store on the way home, bought some $20 clippers and Okay, and there we got it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can't wait to see those pictures. Yeah, they're terrible. All right, great. <laughs> All right, question one. 
All right. Question number one for us. <laughs> Where okay. should we draw the line when it comes to our children's friends? Oh, in the sand. Okay, no, sorry. The question continues. Okay, okay, sorry. You sidewalk chalk at our house. <laughs> Most of our close family friends share our strong faith in Jesus Christ, but there are Keep so those many. Friends. Absolutely. Start there. Right? But there are so many in our area who do not. That's they are true. nice families, but we do not have common belief about Christ in the Bible. So, how close should we allow our kids to be involved in friendship with those other families? Can I jump in on this one for just a second? From perspective. Just one second. You're the family, you're the family pastor. I'm going to let you do this one. I'm going to let you do this one. I want to share I want to share from example for us as a as a as a Christian family. So, my boys um, was when we moved to Idaho Falls, I mean, they 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 are these guys are mature a lot of their friends are older, especially their their church relationships are older. I mean, they're they're around yeah. older uh, Ben especially. Mm-hmm. I mean, the worship team. He has guys that are a generation, two generations older than him that are his friends, um, and so he has these great Christian friends that are also mentors and are older than him. And he also has peer group friends. But um, our boys uh, went to public school when we came here, and uh, my boys have had in their circle of friends. Uh, friends from every ethnic group um, and every uh, piece of diversity you could imagine um, and they have been able to be salt and light. Um, now keeping in mind perspective, my boys when we moved here uh, were uh, 14 and, and 17 when we moved here um, and uh, 50, uh, yeah, it was, uh, four, yeah 14 and 16 and you know they quickly had birthdays. Um, and so they have been a witness. They have been light out there with all their friends. And we've gotten to know their friends and, and we've had an ability to have an influence in their lives. Um, and, you know, do unsaved people influence our children? Well, yes, they absolutely do. But the issue is, am I still an influence in their life? So I'm influencing them so they can be an influence. And so we talk about relationships. We talk about the things they're talking about. Um, but I've always, I've always appreciated my boys who have been really good about uh, they, 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 their friends don't look like them. Their friends don't act like them. And they're able to be light uh, for the gospel mm-hmm. in those situations. And, and I've always appreciated that. When they were younger, um, I'll be totally honest with you. When they were younger, yeah, all the kids they played with were kids from the church. That was kind of our, our normal thing. But we lived out in the country in Salmon, so they didn't have neighbors. Mm-hmm. You know, all their neighbors were in their 80s, you know, where we happened to live. There were no kids, in the, you know, in the, the, the farm area that we were in. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's just for, for us anyway. Um, and so I, I would always draw the line where if I saw the influence going too far to the negative, I would have to step in and mm-hmm. say something. But Dave? Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's part of parenting, right? You you say to little little Billy or little Susie, I'm, I'm sorry, pal. I'm sorry, sweetheart. You you can't play with that child. That that's just not going to happen. You're, or you're, they can come over here, but no, you may not go spend the night at their house. Uh, why not? Well, because we happen to know the Smiths and the Joneses, whoever it is. Um, and you know what? Because I'm dead. That's why. Because I'm bigger than you. No, <laughs> but you know. Because, well, and there, and sometimes you know, those conversations have to happen. There are times like when, yeah, yeah I'm, I, because I'm not going to gossip with you and tell you why, son. But I am going to tell you, uh, there's not a snowball's chance in Hades that you're spending the night at that house. Because you have now, their best interest. And there it is, right? At some point, you just have to say, "I'm your dad. Either you trust me or you don't. And if you don't trust me, I still win. So you're not spending the night. Um, but because I know what's best for you." You know, um, so here's here's the deal. There are also <laughs> we home educated for years, and most of our uh, kids' friends were from Hosanna, Calvary Chapel, Bellflower, and part of the homeschooling fellowship, right? Right. Um, just yeah. by virtue of the fact that's who we kind sort of hung out with, yeah. right? But guess what? There were people in that group, Christians, home educators, same philosophy of life, same worldview that you would go, hmm, not crazy about that friendship, right? Mm -hmm. Attitudes that would start to creep in. So you can't just say, well, hey, 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 
if they are not Baptist and we're Baptist, if they're not Calvary Chapel and we're Calvary Chapel, if they're not Catholic and we're Catholic, you can't be friend. No, that, that's, a, that's a silly line. Yeah, but let me say this. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 speaks directly to friendship. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Paul says, do not be deceived. That's King James for don't be stupid. Okay. <laughs> Evil company corrupts good morals or corrupts good habits. And so Paul warns, hey, be careful who your friends are because they are going to rub off on you. Um, I'll give you a real hint. I've, I've lived in Idaho Falls for a year and a half. I've known Michelle Talaski for a little over a year. Michelle rubs off on me. Ty and Lori, Sylvia and I have known for 30 years yep, plus. 30 years, a little over 30 years. Ty now. rubs off on me. Lori rubs off on me. Whoever you become involved with uh, in terms of friends, not just acquaintances. I have acquaintances, lots of acquaintances, who don't necessarily rub off on me. Maybe I like them, maybe I don't. Maybe we have the same worldview, maybe I don't. But they're my acquaintances, and quite frankly, their opinions or their attitudes or their habits, eh, they don't rub off on me. But my companions, he says, don't be deceived. Evil companions corrupt good morals or habits. Um, the other thing I would say in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 20. So 2, 2, 2, okay? 2 Timothy 2, 20. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some for honor, some for dishonor. If you want to purge yourself from these, those of dishonor, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if you want to purge yourself from these, to be a vessel of honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared for every good work. You must flee youthful lusts. You must purge yourself from the vessels of dishonor. Mm -hmm. And so um, Tulaski and I, we love to hang out. Shane and I, we love to hang out. The three of us, we make a great team, right? Um, because our habits, our morals, our views, our, our topics of conversation, uh, when we do stuff around the church or if we have ministry together, we hang out. We love it because I don't ever have to worry that Tulaski is going to show up and say, hey, I got this really great dirty joke I heard. Shane never uses dirty language. Um, they're vessels of honor. So not to judge you, Michelle. Uh, you know, I'm not your judge, but um, I, I'm a discerner and I discern that you're a vessel of honor. So I love hanging out with Michelle. Sylvie and I, you know, we like to do double dates with Ty and Lori. Why? Because I'll tell you right now, and again, I'm not blowing smoke. Ty doesn't have to, he doesn't owe me any money if I say this, although I, I, I like fish tacos. Okay, um, just checking. <laughs> okay. Just Ty, want to make sure where we're at today. So, okay. Ty Orr, who, who is my pal, uh, and he's my pastor, right? So I'm, I'm very careful, especially around the church, I always say Pastor Ty. But behind closed doors, when it's just Dave and Ty and Syl and Lori, He's the same guy that he is sitting right here. He's the same guy sitting here as he is in the pulpit. Uh, we don't go out to Arugula Deli, grab dinner, and, and say, hey, let's throw back a few drinks, man. And hey, did you really see that hot looking chick? Or hey, let me tell you this dirty story. No, the reason I love hanging out with Ty and Lori, and Sylvia and I love hanging out with Ty and Lori, is because they're the same people in pr private, behind closed doors, as they are in public. In other words, again, not judging you, Ty. Not I'm sure. not your judge, but discerning. Ty and Lori are vessels of honor. Sylvia and I want to be vessels of honor. There are people we just choose not to hang out with. And I'll be honest, sometimes it's family. There are family members that we just go, we're not allowing them to invest that time into our lives because they are vessels of dishonor. Do we go to the family reunions and hang out for a few days? Absolutely. While we're there, do we laugh and cut up and then play the board games? Absolutely. We have a great time and we share our faith and we talk about Jesus and we talk about where we are in the word until they finally get upset and walk out and go to their cabin. <laughs> right. But, so we, we have acquaintance with them. We have a link to them. Are they friends? Because the question was about friendship. 
Mm -hmm. right. That means companionship. You, you got to be very careful. Look, David and Jonathan were soulmates. They were so close that King Saul, Jonathan's father, accused him of having a homosexual affection toward David, right? And, and Jonathan doesn't even answer. It's like, that's not, I'm not even gonna dignify that with an answer, Dad, right? But here, David is friends, best friends, soulmates. Their souls were knit together, it says. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan was part of a family who was quite evil, who wanted David dead. Jonathan's father was chucking spears at David. He wants David dead, and yet David, his best friend is Jonathan. And when the going got tough, the Bible says, Jonathan went out to David and strengthened his hand in the Lord. So your kids' friends, maybe their parents aren't solid Christians, but what if the kid is? And what if your kid can influence that kid like David influenced Jonathan? So there's, I don't think there is a hard line in the sand. If you're not yeah. Baptist, we can't be your friends. If you're not Calvary Chapel, we can't be your friends. If, if you're not born again Christians, we can't be your friends. I don't know about that. But if that companionship were to begin to affect your children's habits, their morals, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, nip it. If your kids are vessels of honor, but because of this friendship, this relationship, they become, you know, they start to act more like vessels of dishonor, purge it. Mm -hmm. And I think too, remember that there's a huge difference between a bunch of kids in the neighborhood we go play at the playground with and a friendship. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes we do use the term friendship pretty loosely. Um, and so, but here's the, what I do know. Every opportunity of parenting is an opportunity to teach both us as parents and our kids. Mm -hmm. And so, hey, if they're at the playground and Johnny at the playground <clears throat> is using a bad word and our kid comes home and uses a bad word, we're gonna tell them why we don't use the bad word. We're gonna explain what the problem is. And, and But does that mean we'll never let them go back to the playground again? No, because I just taught them how to go to the playground. I just taught them how to live a life of honor in the midst right. of a world of dishonor. And that's really, I think, one of those things we, mm -hmm. we, need, we wanna teach our children is how do you have friends and acquaintances that are may not be believers or may not be followers of Jesus because you're the light for them and you mm -hmm. still are loyal to the Lord, trusting God, mm -hmm. even if they're not loyal to the Lord and not trusting God. Mm -hmm. Can you draw them, instead of letting them draw you away, can you draw them closer? And at some point in time, every friendship gets that, mm -hmm. that with believers and unbelievers gets strained to the point where the believer usually has to say, hey, I cannot do this or the unbeliever goes, I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to go live in my sin. Yeah. And, and that happens. But we want our kids to be mature enough to recognize that. So my son uh, had that situation come up where um, something really just sideways happened uh, with a guy that he was given a ride to some other things. And, and uh, I, I just said, hey, dude, seriously. And I just like, you know, and I'm, I'm very rarely upset with my children. I mean, this was one of those moments where I was upset because just I was like, where was your head, you know, at this moment? It went sideways real bad. It went sideways real bad. <laughs> yeah. And it was it was really interesting because the... A pastor's, of, a pastor's kid's not uh, perfect? What? <laughs> none of mine are. Uh, and so, but he... But I asked him about six months later, he goes, oh, oh, no, no, no. After that day, I haven't said one word to yeah. him. I, I, he, my son made that choice. I didn't tell him. I said, this isn't cool. That's what I was saying but he made all the decisions in his life yeah. to protect himself from that. Right. Uh, because I just did the math for him. And he goes, yeah, and he just protected himself. And so I, I think that a lot of times we have to realize that our kids, we have to let them grow up. We can't protect our children from every little thing. And sometimes we... Well, we use those opportunities though to mentor them. To, that's right, because right. We, yeah, we want to mentor them. Right. And there are times that we do have to purify. We have to pull them away and go, uh-uh, this is hurting you. But there are times that we have to remember that our kids are going to grow up and go out into a world. And if we keep them isolated for 18 years, they're going to go out there and they're going to have no idea how to handle betrayal. Um, they're not going to know how to handle people who are uh, inappropriate. They're not going to know how to walk away. Um, I remember my dad teaching me to, as a young boy how to walk away from a fight. He said, the best fight, best fight you're ever in is the, the one you're not in. Is the one you're not in. That's right. And my dad taught me to walk away from a fight when I was in kindergarten. 
And I never forgot those lessons. Yeah, but you're not supposed to fight your kindergarten teacher, Ty, so that was a good lesson. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? She had some I could take her. <laughs> but so, here's, yeah. here's the flip side, pardon me. Here's the flip side of that coin. <laughs> what? Would you like a squeegee? <laughs> I know, I was Do you just... want to clean off your glasses? <laughs> right? Here's the flip side of that coin though, right? Now, um, I had two, three, pardon me, great mentors as a young guy growing up, a kid growing up, at Kimpton Carroll, Roger Holland, and Coach Broswell. These guys poured into me. Two of them from our church, one was my coach. Uh, coach Broswell, not a born again evangelical Christian, but he taught me about life, right? Then as a young man, uh, now I'm married, and Sylvie and I have a couple of kids, and uh, I'm managing an Italian restaurant in Los Angeles, and the guy that taught me the most in my entire life about how to lead people, to just lead people, uh, was a guy who his favorite curse word was Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know, um, uh, watched things that were inappropriate, used inappropriate language. Um, but man, this guy loved me. I don't know why Ralph Chico DeMarco loved me, but he loved me. He loved my wife, loved our kids. And he and his wife were just so good to us, right? And I worked for Ralph for three and a half years. And man, did he teach me life lessons, right? Years later, I mean years later, uh, I got word from California, you're never going to guess who came to faith in Christ, Ralph Chico DeMarco. Mm -hmm. And he said it's because of the kids from Calvary Baptist that we brought in and hired, and their testimony over the years wore mm -hmm. him down until he finally, now uh, he and his wife, Pina, Josephina, uh, they go to Jack Hibbs Church in Southern California. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I mean, had I gone in there that first day that Ralph offered me a job and said, hey, Dave, you want to come work for me? And if I'd have said, oh, no, I know he's not an evangelical Christian. I can't be friends with him. Um, I, I just don't know. I just don't know what would have happened. And the guy who taught me, my, really my mentor in special ed, which I did for 10 years in Oregon, worked uh, in a, a progressive autism program. And this guy taught me so much. I'm so indebted to Vince Zettler who was Buddhist, not a born again Christian. We had many, many great conversations in typical Buddhist fashion. Oh, Dave, I just so appreciate your view. Now, I don't agree, and I love the teachings of Christ on love, but I, I just can't go, you know. You know? <laughs> but he became a very, very good friend. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, hopefully before he meets his maker, that he'll make that decision for Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Next question. How do I answer a theolog... Oh my goodness. Theological question. How do you answer a theological question? Okay. Uh, is that a theological question? Yeah, it is a theological <laughs> question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and... Boom, I'm, come yeah. on. So I'm going to talk about this in three different ways, and how you answer this. Um, First of all, there's um, three different ways we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about this right now. There's uh, deductive, inductive, and retroductive. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first one is deductive. That is where you wanna answer a theological question. So you send a question into uh, pastor's Q&A and we give you an answer. That's actually deductive. Uh, and so the question is like, okay, so I have a question, a uh, theological question. So it's kind of like, which John do you go to? Do you go to John MacArthur? Do you go to John Hege? Do you go to John Calvin? Do we, we, I mean, which John do you want to go to? John Corson, of John course. John Corson, right, <laughs> right. And so you, you, go to, you go to your John and you hear them, uh, you hear their answer and you go, great. Well, there is a little bit of a problem with that. It can only go so far. You, sure. you, you're, you're hearing those guys aren't going to agree. And, <laughs> and, and, and those guys aren't going to agree everything. on everything. Right, right, right. Uh, they're going to agree on uh, some very important essentials, but, uh, but you're, you're, but you're hearing from someone else. You're not doing it yourself. And the, the hermeneutic of that is they're going to try and let the clear passage explain the unclear passage. The, the issue is one guy's clear passage might be different than another guy's clear passage. But you're hearing deductively from somebody, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. When we go to church, 
what kind are we receiving when we go to church? Of course, deductive. It's deductive, right? Yeah. Um, and so we're hearing an answer that's your Sunday school teacher, your, your Sunday pastors, school teacher, your pastor. Yes. The second one is inductive. Now, inductive is when you open the Bible. You get your hands dirty. You get your hands dirty. <laughs> and or you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 nice. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, so you open the Bible and inductively you are going through the scripture yourself. So um, you're going through it. So you're not becoming your own, John. You're becoming a student of the scripture. Right. And inductively you are deciding what the scripture says regarding this question that you have. So you use your method, OIA, observation, interpretation, interpretation application. application. And right. you've, you've done some inductive study. Right. Um, there, is a, there is a little bit of a weakness to that too, because you can only go fo so far as you can go. Um, and the other side of that is that you're going to make some decisions. You're going to go, I'm going to use the clearest passage to uh, help me understand the unclear passage. The problem, the same thing that happens in deductive study, you might inductively come up and say, that's my clear passage. And so I'm gonna use this clear passage to explain the unclear one or the unclear ones over here. That's gonna be my, my, the way I go about that. Um, inductive study is something every Christian should be able to do. You go through, you observe the text, you, in, you get a good interpretation of the text. The issue is a lot of times when we're getting interpretation, we have a tendency to do it deductively because we go to our Johns. We, we go to people so, who have, because we're, we're trying to understand When we talked about the OIA method, observation, interpretation, application, which is what I taught uh, when I taught here at Water Springs, when I taught Bible, uh, taught the students inductive uh, Bible study. Uh, observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? Application, what do I do? Or how does it work? Right. right. And, and the, the, the what does it mean part is where people can get a little goofy, a little messed up because... Boy, I'm a real John MacArthur guy, and so when I want to know what it means, I go get my John MacArthur commentary. Or I'm a real John Corson guy, so I go get my John Corson commentary. Instead of getting your hands, you've got to get your hands dirty if you're going to do it right. If you're going to do it right, you, because you here's the thing. It. If you're trying to answer, answer a theological question, you decide, I'm going to do it inductively. I am going to observe the text, then I'm going to interpret the text, but I go get the John MacArthur study. Uh, Bible, or I get the Tony Evans study Bible, or I get a commentary by Walvert and Zook or somebody, or John Corson, um, you are now doing part of your inductive yeah. study deductively. Yeah. You're actually taking somebody else's word for it instead of just looking at the text. By the way, observation and interpretation take a long time. Yeah. Application is how does it apply to me? How does it apply to others? But here's my encouragement. When you're doing inductive study, it's about how it applies to you no one else. That's where you start with your, your application. When I'm preparing for a Bible study here um, to share with the congregation, I am studying inductively to share deductively, right. but I am, what, how does this apply to me first? Sure. I, it has to apply to me or I can't apply to well, anybody else. Well, if the else. teacher doesn't learn, then he's got, or he or she he or has she. nothing to teach. That's right. You've, you've got to learn first. Yeah. So there's another way to answer theological questions. Um, in I want to say reductive is the first thing that comes to my mind, but uh, a way that it was explained to me was retroductive. In other words, what you do now, this is it has a different hermeneutic as well, because you know, a clear passage, unclear passage, the first two. Um, this one where you take Bible open inductively, you sit down with people and you're not doing it in a vacuum. Uh, one of the issues is, is that theology shouldn't be done in a vacuum. So sometimes deductive uh, study can be in a vacuum. Our inductive study is often find we find ourselves in a vacuum. That's why deductively we reach out and we get commentaries. But uh, reductive or retroductive uh, study or theology is what happens is we, I'm going to sit down with uh, a guy who disagrees with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be a cessationist, and I'm a continuationist. And I'm going to sit down with him, my Bible open. I'm going to be listening to his position. I'm going to be listening to my position, and I'm going to be taking notes. And maybe another person who's uh, like a hyper, hyper uh, Pentecostal, and I'm going to sit down with them, and they're like, oh man, you know, it's all about that liquid love, man. You got to have it going on. And it's going to be interesting to me because I'm going to watch these two kind of mm -hmm. talk about it. I'm going to listen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with my position. I'm going to take as much, I'm going to take as much scriptural information as I can and put it together. 
my conclusion is going to come from as many verses as possible with the fewest amount of problems. In other words, I have to realize that there might not be something that I can answer. Mm -hmm. Because a um, great example that we have is we have, the Cal we have Calvinism and we have Arminianism. And they're both biblically taught. And they're both biblically arguable. Oh, so yeah, what, you, you, sure, yeah, right? you can make an argument for either one. Right. Bible bash the other guy and, and make your case. Right. In fact, they do debates at college levels of Arminius versus Calvinist. And unbelievers come in and just leave laughing because these guys, their scriptures don't agree or things like that. So I'm, I'm probably more of a Calvinist. Uh, their interpretation uh, of the scriptures don't agree. Yeah, yeah, their interpretation right, of the right, scriptures right, right. don't agree. And so I'm probably more of a Calvinist somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, and, and the more I actually think about it, I probably have been more of a Calvinist. I probably have three-point Calvinist than I was anything else until I had to start really looking at the scriptures. And, and I want to listen to other people. I don't want to do my theology in a vacuum. I'm like, oh, I understand. Okay, I see what you say there. And so, okay, yeah, that actually does fit within how I view this. And so, but that doesn't fit within what I think it fits into. So now I have more scriptural information, and I come up with my my theological position after looking at as much scripture as I can, listening to how other people are understanding that scripture as well. So I don't do it in a void. Dave, we pastors meeting, last pastors meeting we had, we were talking about the issue of good works together right. as pastors. Right. That's a great example. Now we're all yep. kind of the same tribe, but we're, we're not, we, we right. have, you know, you know, obviously you and Joe kind of joke around I, as the yeah, token Baptist. I grew Baptist. up as a fundamentalist Baptist. Joe uh, got saved and then pastored in a Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. And then we've got some, well, we've got Heinz 57 on our Yeah, we got, uh, yeah, our, our pastoral staff's kind of the Heinz 57. A lot of us lean towards a very non-denominational position on a lot of things. Right. But as we start talking together, we're actually having conversations where mm -hmm. we're actually talking about Hey, how do you see that? I had a conversation with somebody this last week about uh, the Lord and that Jesus's prayers were always answered. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm, the, my first response is he prayed for deliverance and didn't get it. Um, you know, and so I'm thinking, well, I can't, I can't make that statement because of the way I look at it. But I'm listening and I want to listen to that position. And I go, well, you know what? I, I can see that position. I can see why you've taken that position. I disagree and this is why I disagree, but we, but that, I mean, that really comes down to, you know, when Jesus is praying in the garden, you know, he says, you know, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. And nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Um, and in the sense of praying for God's will to be done, yeah, that was answered. I see that in the affirmative, but he was praying for deliverance. So I go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that part was answered. Uh, and, and so we, but see those, sometimes you have also in the idea of theology, you have to decide what is worth the fight and what's not worth the fight. There's the die force, right? There's the divide force, mm -hmm. there's the debate force, and there's the decide force. You, you, you know, there's, there's these different issues. There's this different level, like, you know, when it comes to theological issues, when it comes to what I'm gonna die for, Jesus Christ is salvation. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That is a die for. The work of the Holy Spirit in the church, uh, you know, uh, the triunity of God, the unity of God. I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna hold on to those. These are, we will die for these things. But then there's like divide for. Divide for are things where like, we can't do ministry together because of one issue or another. Right. Like how we view the sacraments would probably be like a divide for, right? Yeah. Um, but then there's the debate over, right? What, what do we debate over, right? I mean, what are things that we can have a conversation but still do ministry together? Right. Right, we can still have conversations about. We can talk about. Should you and, pass the bag or use a box? Let's well, talk yeah. about that. Well, yeah, and, and I, I think it, divide over that. Well, and, and you know what? Will. And possibly that would actually go under the just decide for. Yeah, we're look. We're doing chairs that move, not pews, and we're doing bags, and we don't sing hymns. That's really on a decide for, not a debate for. In some of the debate for churches want to argue about music and how music works and right. things like that. But that really, unfortunately, falls into a divide for where it shouldn't. But here's an interesting thing, the study of end times. Mm -hmm. End times has ended up being a divide for issue when it probably needs to be a decide for issue where the church has taken it so harsh that we were dividing over how we view uh, the rapture, something we divide mm -hmm. over. Where is that, or is that just something we can debate over and have good conversation and go, hey, we can see seven different possibilities from the scripture. Let's own it and let's all, let's all hope for the best, you know, and, 
And, and, and so, so I mean, you, you, yeah. you know, you can drive your stakes down deep if that's, for whatever reason, important to you to, to drive your stakes down deep. But while you're driving your stakes down deep, re remember that the guy next to you, maybe he doesn't drive his as deep. Live with it. Yeah. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a hardcore. I mean, I am hardcore pre-millennial, pre-tribulation rapture guy. Not yeah. even a, you know, it's just and, not even and, a question. And I am too. I, I read the book of Revelation, I read First Thessalonians, I read Daniel, and I go, yep, yeah, nope, we're out. Yeah. Right? And I, man, I am hardcore on that. But when I was pastoring in Oregon, I had uh, three deacons, uh, Bob, Chris, and Jonathan, who were all hardcore, mid and still are, mid-tribbers. Absolutely, we go through the first three and a half years, uh, pre-wrath, you know, right. And, and I can pretty much guarantee in most Calvary chapels, I won't give a percentage, I don't know, but in most Calvary chapels, they probably would not have been invited to serve as deacons. Most guys would say, oh no, if you're not a hardcore pre-tribber, then I, I can't have you working with me. I, I thought, you know, these guys are great. They love the Lord Jesus. Um, at least two of them, I can still hear their voices saying, hey man, you know what? Um, I'm going to prepare for post and pray for pre. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. <laughs> kind of the Keith Green mentality, you know. Right. I'm, like, I'm down with that. I'll explain it to you on the way up, but you know, <laughs> right. when we go, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you why I was right and you were wrong. But you know, we, we can laugh together. I and mean, when we had some heavy discussions over it, but at the end of the day, it's like, hey, we got work to do, let's go. And we all worked together. Um, I never pulled their stakes out of the ground. I was never successful at letting them figure out why I was right and they were wrong. Uh, and they were never successful the other way. So we just had unity, understanding that we, we view these things differently. Well, and you guys fell under that debate for it. You guys had, you had good conversations, you listened, but that's the issue. Well, and all you three of these guys still other? contact me on a right. very rate, and that's been years ago. We're all very good friends. Right. We pray for each other. And when there's going through strife or struggle, or having to make a decision, we're thinking about planning a church here or there, whatever. And we pray together. We call and pray in the spirit together. It's, just, it's beautiful. Yeah. You know? And but I they think, don't yeah. call and say, hey, Dave, have you changed your mind yet on the rapture? No, okay, well, I can't pray. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, we're not there. And that's where I think you, you realize you start thinking, hey, these are. When you want to answer a theological question, first of all, you have to understand what the word theology means. First, theology proper is a study of God. A study of God. And so God's desire, God's heart. Um, and, you know, if, if you're asking this question and you're in this place going, I really want to understand theology, you have to start understanding some terminology. Um, you, you can contact me uh, through Michelle at watersprings.net. I will, I will give you a copy of a theological dictionary. Just you can start learning some terminology. But but I, I think the biggest issue is just what is God's heart and God's will, and we study that through the Word. So whether you're listening to somebody teach, you are a Berean as we're told to do, and you go back to the Word and you check that teacher Act, out 17, from the Word, absolutely. And then inductively, you need to check yourself with the Word. Right. And then I encourage people, um, and I'm encouraging our young people to do this more and more, and our pastoral staff to do this more. We don't want to be doing our studies in a void. We don't want to be doing our theology in a vacuum. We want to make sure we're talking to each other. Hey, that verse, what does that mean to you, and how have you applied that? And, how, and, and we begin to learn from each other. You know, uh, I was talking to Scotty. We were talking about the community thing. I was at the football game before I taught that message on, on coming back to community. And um, he, he said, well, God lives... God is a community. He lives in community because of the. And I was like, it hadn't occurred to me yet. I mean, as in the study, and it was like, just all those things just started to flow because, you know, Pastor Scotty mentioned that, that triunity of God, that God exists in, a, in, in the essence of community mm -hmm. and love and fellowship. And I was like, well, that's what we're supposed to be, then, mm -hmm. as the church. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, that's important. And I, I just I want to encourage people that make sure you're studying the word. Uh, you're listening when you study, you're, you're critical. Be a critical thinker, study the Word of God, ask questions when you have them. That's why we have a program like this. And then uh, make sure you're studying it yourself and then you have, you have other people you're studying with. 30 seconds and I'm done. Oh, that's good. Because right. I'm going to take the other side of that. What if the question is, how do I answer a question about theology if I don't feel equipped or adequate? And Pastor Ty just answered that at the end of this conversation, but it really is about study, right? Second Timothy 2.15. Yes. Study to show thyself approved unto God, 
a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's called theology. Yes. So you, you do, you gotta get your hands dirty. You can't just say, well, Pastor Chuck Smith says, or Charles Stanley says, or John MacArthur says, or pick one. Uh, I mean, yeah. you can do that when you're first starting out, but honestly, you guys, um, get a good study Bible, go to Bible studies, um, learn, and be equipped, be equipped. And man, I'll tell you, we've got guys around here that love, and, and gals too, that love meeting with people, uh, you know, once a week or whatever it takes. Hey, let me let me help equip you for this. So yes. if that's if that's where that question's yeah. coming, and we're super getting, excited about seeing a little more uh, than thirty seconds, yeah, yeah, yeah. seeing men and women come together to help other people. Really encourage me, yep. you know. So I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to see what God's going to do. And we're that. going for a third question today. Ooh. Stop it! Ooh. What is Cut the best? It out. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best analogy to use when explaining the Trinity to an unbeliever or perhaps a new Christian? Can you? Can we do a you know, question? All I can <laughs> think of right now. Having these two questions. Satire, so, so, so the uh, worst part. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a video in for you. Uh, by Lutheran satire, which will explain all of this. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> but here's, here's the thing that I have to share with everybody. There's no way to answer this question. It's, it's kind of a, it's a no-win. There is not a great example, because every earthly example of the Trinity falls apart That's at right. some point. They all have some sort of logic error in them. Um, and so one theologian uh, who's gone home to be with the Lord, Norm Geisler, said, hey, the best thing I could come up with was a triangle. He just put the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit in the three corners. It's, 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 but it's one triangle. It's three sides. It's, you know, and that was the best thing he could do to explain it. So if you're looking for something to do that, that was, that's, the, that's the most theologically sound one. And then explaining how God became man, it's you just put a circle at the end of that one point of the triangle where the sun is, and then he became man. You know, he just, because he was trying to find a way to graphically explain it, but it was like, I've, I've heard the example, it's like an egg. No, um, I've heard the example, terrible. it's like, oh, it's like ice uh, and terrible. water and steam. steam. Or my, my favorite one though, it was like a good Southern pie. Now I actually like this one because, <laughs> of course you know, we because do. remember when you have a good cherry pie, it's not supposed to look like jello between two pieces of cardboard. In the middle, it's supposed to be all gooey and runny, right? And so they explained it like this. If you got a good cherry pie and you cut it into three pieces, what you see from the top is the line of demarcation, but you know, and underneath it's still one pie. And I thought, Okay. Modalism. <laughs> yeah, modalism. <laughs> exactly. And that's exactly what it is. And so what happens is we end up trying to explain through an analogy, but we end up doing modalism. We end up doing uh, oneness. We end up doing all these other things that are actually not the Trinity. God exists, and I, I don't use the word Trinity very often. I like to use the word triunity uh, because God is unity and God is triunity. Um, and so I always try and encourage people in that. But this is a hard one. I'm going to be honest with you. This is just a hard one. Yeah, so it comes down to this, gang. Um, you know, how do you explain faith? How am I going to explain faith? Because the question is, right, how, what's the best analogy to use when explaining uh, the triunity to an unbeliever? Uh, listen, gang, um, how, <laughs> how are you going to explain faith? Because this comes down to faith. Now, I, I just two things I want to say very quickly. God, God said that he, he created man in his own image. We are a triunity, right? We are body, soul, and spirit. Um, at, when, at the fall of man, the spirit died immediately. In the day you eat of that fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. They died. Um, that's why in Ephesians, Paul says, your spirit hath he quickened. He's made your spirit alive. When you're born again, that spirit comes to life, okay? Um, that's a whole other thing we don't have time for. We're almost out of time now. But um, the, the other deal, what was I talking about? I you had all two of things. a sudden I had, oh, You had two yeah. things. Uh, <laughs> we're we're a triune being. Right, so here's the other thing. I'm sorry, I just all of a sudden blanked out. I want to give a, a great book recommendation. Years ago, um, I was listening to a rare recording of C.S. Lewis. And uh, in this teaching from C.S. Lewis, he said, uh, we can't neglect 
uh, the classics. And he said, uh, anybody who, if, if, if we neglect the classics, we neglect orthodoxy. And if you haven't read uh, On the Incarnation by St. Athanasius, I mean, then, then where are you at kind of thing? You know, and I thought, wait a minute, did C.S. Lewis just give a book recommendation? And did he, did he just challenge Christians that if you haven't read this book, you're missing something? So uh, I looked online and sure enough, you can find the book On the Incarnation by uh, St. Athanasius. He's a, a third century saint. Uh, brilliant man, brilliant theologian, holy mackerel. So I got the book on the incarnation. And after reading the third page five times, trying to figure out what is he saying, I knew I was way over my head. And fortunately, I found it on Audible, not by St. Athanasius, because he wasn't recording in the third century. But there is somebody who's really scratchy on the rock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> But it really helped me. I, I sat down with my book and then I could listen to this guy reading it and my comprehension just skyrocketed. All that to say this, the Athanasian Creed regarding the Trinity is far and away the best explanation of the Trinity. And I would highly recommend you go online, Google it, the Athanasian Creed by St. Athanasius. Get the book on the Incarnation by St. Athanasius, get it on Audible <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and listen to it. Uh, I have listened to it now 12 times. It's, it's that good, uh, but it's good theology on the Trinity, uh, no analogies. Cool, awesome. Are you looking something else up? Uh, I was, well, the internet was, I was gonna read the, uh, the, 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 the St. Ath the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed on the Trinity. Bottom line is, <laughs> he says, and we take it by faith. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. Yeah, we take it by faith. There we go. I, maybe we should put Lutheran satire at the end of this one just for people to yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. It's hilarious. Thanks it is. for it's, answering the questions hey, today. It's, it was our pleasure. Thank you for tuning in. Again, if you have any questions, Michelle at watersprings.net. Ready? Love you guys. God bless you. Your family. Oh, you're Wait, loved. You're loved. You're loved. Your you're family. family. You're Water, Water Springs. Springs. Bye, guys. Just mess. They won't do that to you, right?